how can I serve a custom language model for many customers? That's a very common question I get from those who have fine-tuned their models. So today, I'm going to show you how to do this most cost-effectively. I'll walk you through all the steps from choosing a GPU to choosing software to set up the API to choosing software to then allow you inference that API and manage the questions you pose and the responses you get. So let's talk about serving a custom LML, LLM for 100 plus customers. And here's what we have for agenda. There are three key things that you need. First, you need to choose a GPU server, whether that's your own or when you rent. Then you need to pick the software to run an API. The two I'll talk particularly about are text generation inference from Hugging Face and VLLM, which is an independent project. Last of all, you need some software that's going to organize your messages and send them to the API, then deal with the responses that come back. And optionally, you might be interested in being able to handle function calls. I'm going to take you through all of that in an end-to-end -end example, and then we'll have the usual final notes and resources. Before I do the end-to-end -end example, let me walk you through some of the high-level choices you can make for a GPU and also for software. To do this, I'm going to walk through the advanced inference repo. You can purchase access to this on trellis.com, but hopefully I'll go through in enough detail that you'll be able to grasp the main ideas, even if you don't buy it. The advanced inference repo has just been reorganized, and there are two main folders. There's a folder called server and API setup, which helps you choose a server and choose some software to run an API. And then there's a folder called API calls, allowing you to make calls to the API, including concurrent calls, speed tests, and calls including functions. So let's take a look inside the server and API setup, particularly at the readme file. I want to talk you through briefly choosing a server, and then I want to talk through choosing API software. That's software that lets you serve an API that many users, or perhaps just yourself, can make requests to at once. So let's start off with choosing a server. At a really high level, you're going to consider a few different options. The first you might consider is OpenAI. Particularly if you're looking for something cost effective, you're probably considering the GPT 3.5 Turbo model. And probably for the vast majority of cases, that's going to be the most cost effective option because you only pay for each token that you use in inference. If you move to running your own server, you're going to be moving to paying for it on an hourly basis or you need to own the hardware. And so it's much harder to just pay on a small incremental basis. Furthermore, because OpenAI have so many users, they're able to batch together many, many requests and amortize the costs across all of those requests. And it's just really hard to beat that in terms of the cost per token that they're able to achieve, particularly on the GPT 3.5 Turbo. However, if you need some privacy and you don't want to send data to OpenAI, or if you want to serve a custom model, which after all is what this video is all about, then you're going to need to either, to either have your own hardware or to rent some hardware. So there are two options I'll go through here for renting hardware, RunPod and VastAI. I'll also talk briefly about AWS and Azure. First, let me just mention that you could also run on your own computer hardware. Perhaps you have bought a GPU or perhaps you have a Mac with an M1 or M2 chip. Now, these are good for delivering good performance, but you will need to leave them online and people will need to be able to access them because your computer would be, would be serving, would be, well, it, your computer would be serving as a server. And that's maybe not something you want because you might be using the computer for something else, or you might have, you might not want the hassle of leaving it online, or it might be difficult to reliably leave your own computer online. So generally, while it's good for testing purposes and maybe even good for training, probably you don't want to use your own computer if you're going to be serving customers. That brings me to the option of renting GPUs. And I'll go through a few here in reverse order. First off, and actually I first looked at AWS and I've also looked at Azure. I think for smaller companies and startups, it can be very hard to get access to the GPUs on their services. And I've also found them quite expensive per hour compared to some of the more market rate services. So that's why in this video, I'm going to focus on two, RunPod and Vast.ai. In a lot of my videos so far, I've been using either Google Collab, which is good, 
but more tricky to set up for APIs. And I've also covered a lot the use of RunPod. So today, I'm going to mostly focus on Vast AI. But let me give you some of the key differences I've found between RunPod and Vast AI. For RunPod, I think it's the easiest setup. They provide you with a proxy URL that you can immediately make calls to. Its lowest price GPU is roughly around 30 to 40 cents per hour, although it does depend on the week. And just as a benchmark, an A100, which is an 80 gigabyte or an 80 gigabyte of VRAM A100 is about two euro per hour or $2. It supports one-click templates and you can check out runpod underscore setup, which is the file right here, if you want more detail. The other option is Vast AI that I've recently taken a look to. It's got a little bit more setup because you need to SSH securely connect in to the pod. And to do this requires you to set up a key pair. Uh, there are some instructions in this repo for getting that done. And it's not too bad if you have some clear instructions. Now, it's largely got the same price for GPUs like the A100 or the A6000 or the H100. So very similarly priced to RunPod, about $2 per hour. However, it's got some smaller GPUs that are priced at a lower cost. And if you want a minimum viable API, I think this is probably going to get you the lowest cost of serving. I'm going to show you some GPUs you can get for as low as about 10 cents per hour, which works out to about $100 per month. And this is the cheapest way I've come up with if you want to rent a server that's able to serve maybe 50, 100, or maybe even more depending on where the requests are simultaneous in terms of number of customers. This also supports one-click templates, which I'll be sharing. And there's more detail that we'll go through in the vast AI uh, setup.md file right here. So in short, I would say if I'm using a larger GPU and I want to serve larger models, um, probably I would go for RunPod because it's a similar price to vast AI, but the interface is probably a bit more polished. Vast AI is maybe a little less polished in terms of interacting with the setup, but it does offer these smaller GPUs that I think are good if you want to have something at minimal price just to get started before you decide to spend more on larger servers. That covers the choice of the server, and I will talk a little bit more about the specific server, i.e. A100 or A6000 or A4000 a bit later. So once you have a server up and running, you're going to want to use some software so that it can run an API. And the two types of software I've looked at are text generation inference and VLLM. Now, in principle, and if you're using your own Mac, you could run Llama CPP, or you could run XLS, which is some software I've just been looking at recently. And these work reasonably well for inference, although they're less well set up for serving large volumes of requests. So if you're doing one request, particularly a shorter one, it'll work well. But if you start to parallelize a lot of longer requests, you need some more advanced techniques like flash attention and flash decoding to get the best performance. So let me focus on text generation inference and VLLM. Text generation inference is, I think, and I'm not fully confident, but I think it's probably the fastest for very long contexts, like over 8,000 input tokens. And the reason is it supports flash decoding and flash attention version two. These make more efficient use of the GPU when you have longer context. Text generation inference, it's built by Hugging Face and it leverages some of their libraries for quantization. Uh, notably, it allows you to use bits and bytes for four bit quantization and also EETQ, which is eight bit quantization. This will come up relevant a little bit later. It's useful because if you have a model that say is 16 gigabytes, but you want to reduce it in size to fit in the VRAM of the GPU, you could cut the size in half by doing 8-bit quantization with EETQ, or you could cut it in roughly four by using bits and bytes NF4. And the quality of those quantizations is quite good. Also, they can be done on the fly. So you still specify the main model and the library will look after loading it in quantized form, which is very nice, especially if you've just fine-tuned the model it means you can take the fine-tuned model and don't need to actively run a quantization script. Now, moving to VLLM, one of the benefits is they offer an OpenAI-style API. So if you've built a program already to work with the OpenAI API, 
Um, we're literally going to use and import that OpenAI API and we're going to use it for inference, but on our custom endpoint. So that's a nice compatibility benefit. It offers, in my experience, generally better support for AWQ, which is activation aware quantization um, compared to the text generation inference, although text generation inference has got some support for AWQ. Now, AWQ is better quality than GPTQ, although it can be less well supported by these libraries. AWQ probably is faster as well than the on-the-fly types of quantization that are supported by text generation inference. Um, so if you want to use AWQ, it's probably going to be faster than doing EETQ or bits and bytes, which are on-the-fly quantization. However, you need to have a pre-quantized model. So for example, you might need a model from the bloke on Hugging Face where he has quantized a ton of models and you have to load that quantized model now, if you load a quantized model, there's the benefit that it's smaller, so it's also faster to download and it's faster to load into the server. So that's a benefit too. But if you're coming from a fine tuning perspective, it means if you've made a custom model, you will additionally have to run a quantization script. That's something that's covered in the advanced fine tuning repo. You can check out on trellis.com. Now, whether you're using TGI or VLLM, one of the quickest ways to get started is to use a one-click template. One-click templates will typically use a Docker image in order to do all of the installation automatically. You could alternatively SSH into the instance and then do all of the manual installation of CUDA, which is the software for running the GPU, but it's generally going to be much quicker to get a pre-built Docker image, just run that image, that will pre-install everything and then set the parameters around the models that you want to use. So I'll be showing you a few ready-to-go Docker templates that you can use with TGI and VLLM. They are different Docker templates. There's one for TGI and there's one for VLLM. That brings me on to some tips on GPU selection, for which I need to describe a few of the key parameters of GPUs, and we'll repeat this later on. A GPU uh, typically has, well, it has many important figures of merit. Perhaps the most important are the memory size or the VRAM, the video RAM, and the computational speed, which is typically flops or T-flops for teraflops. A flop is a floating point operation per second. Another parameter is the memory speed. Maybe I haven't called that exactly right, but what's important is the speed with which the GPU is able to read from its VRAM, which is the GPU's memory, into the deep computational units of the GPU. So the way that a model uh, works is you first have it on your hard drive, you load from the hard drive into the VRAM of the GPU. That's the main memory of the GPU. And now anytime calculations need to be done in the GPU, some information, like a small amount, maybe 30 megabytes or 50 megabytes of that, let's say 16 gigabytes of VRAM, only 30 to 50 megabytes of that will be read into the deep computation unit. And that's where the computation happens. And it turns out that's a bottleneck a lot of the time for the inference speed. So this is an important uh, figure of merit as well, although it's typically less prominently displayed when you look at dashboards like um, the RunPod or the Vast AI dashboard. Now, of course, higher values are better. Higher memory lets you fit in a bigger model. Higher computation speed allows you to get higher tokens per second. And higher memory will also allow you to get higher tokens per second. In fact, you're either going to be bottlenecked by the computational speed. So if you ask the model to process more and more tokens, um, it's going to eventually be limited by the computational speed but it could alternatively be bottlenecked by the memory speed, so the speed to read into the deep computational unit. And this uh, can be particularly the case if you have to read a lot of model weights, which is true for larger models. Okay, so let's move on to the first step for picking a GPU, which is based on the VRAM. You need um, the VRAM of the GPU to be bigger than the size of your model, otherwise you're not going you're not going to be able to load it into the GPU. So for example, LAMA 7B, it's a 13 gigabyte model. Uh, let's actually just go and take a look here. Um, we can look at this seven gigabyte model, it's OpenChat, and we can take a look at the files. And you see there are two files. OpenChat is based on Mistral, which is 
kind of similar to Llama. So it's about, you can see 15 gigabytes in size. And um, that means that if you're going to load this onto a GPU, you need to have at least 15 gigabytes in size when you're loading it in 16-bit, um, which is often called BF16. That's a format for, it's one of the 16-bit formats, uh, Brain Float 16. So here you would be recommended to have a 15 gigabyte or maybe even 20 gigabyte for some headroom of uh, VRAM if you want to run a model like Llama 7B. Now, if you've Llama 70B, that's going to be 10 times bigger. So you need to have something like 150 or 200 gigabytes of VRAM. Now, the largest GPUs are typically 80, 80 gigabytes. So you can see if you want to load a Llama 70B model, you're going to need to have at least two of these large, expensive GPUs. One further thing to keep in mind is that when the GPU is processing, it has the full model in memory. So let's say Llama 7B was exactly 13 gigabytes, and let's say your VRAM is 15, so you've got two gigabytes spare. Actually, when that uh, model is processing a given sequence, it needs to store the history, uh, some history of computed values. So you might have a long sentence, you're predicting the next token, and it's common to store some of the earlier calculations because that proves to be useful when you calculate the even next token. So every time you calculate a new token, it's useful if from the previous token you have stored some of that history. And that history is called the KV cache, K for key and V for value. And that history also will take up space in the VRAM. So that's why you need to have space between the size of the GPU and the model size. And the longer your context, the longer the history needs to be stored in the KV cache. And therefore, the more headroom you need to have above the basic model weights inside your VRAM. So the longer the sequences you process, the more extra space and the larger the VRAM and the larger the GPU you need to choose. Now, we'll get to it later, but if you can limit or if your use case is limited to smaller context lengths, then you can limit your context length when you set up the API, and that will allow you to get away with a smaller GPU than if you assume you're going to use the full context length capability. Okay, so what do you do if you want to use a smaller GPU? Let's say, for example, you want to run, let's say you want to run Llama 70B, and you expect you need 150 gigabytes, but you want to run it on a single A100, which has only got 80 gigabytes. Well, with text generation inference, which is some software for setting up your API, um, you can specify quantization options. So there are two options. One is EETQ, which allows you to cut the size of VRAM required in half. So instead of needing 150, you would need roughly 75. So now it barely fits on an A100. Or you can even divide it in four by quantizing to four bit with bits and bytes NF4, and that will reduce the requirement down to four bit quantization. The other option with uh, VLLM, if you're using that software to set up your API, is you could use an AWQ model. For example, here's an AWQ version of the Mistral V02 model, a very nice model that it's a little upgrade to the first Mistral 7B model. And this is quantized. So if we look at the files, you'll see that uh, the model is four gigabytes. Whereas that's just for interest sake, uh, duplicate this. And let's look up um, Mistral 7B V0.2. Uh, yep. So let's look at the files here. And you can see that the safe tensors here. Oh, nice. They've actually pushed safe tensors. That's great. Um, the safe tensors files are roughly 15 gigabytes. So by quantizing, you've saved just a little less than a factor of four. And that will improve the loading time, but it also means the VRAM needed to load the model is going to be smaller. Now, just a comment here on the quantization. It's not a complete free lunch. Um, it's true that you need less VRAM if you quantize or quantize on the fly in the case of TGI. However, your quality will go down, but also it doesn't necessarily save you computation because although the models are quantized when they're being loaded on the VRAM, they are often being dequantized uh, before inference. So 
you can think of it as being loaded in a compact form to the VRAM, but when that information goes deep into the GPU, it's basically being expanded back out to 16 bits in certain cases. Now, it varies based on the type of quantization, but you'll see, for example, with bits and bytes NF4, that this can help you fit into a smaller uh, amount of VRAM. However, if you ping the server with a lot of parallel requests, then eventually the extra computation of having to expand back out into the full precision is going to start to take over your computational workload and it's going to slow down your tokens per second. Um, so it's a handy trick to quantize, particularly these on the fly to fit into a smaller amount of VRAM. But if you start to ping it with a ton of requests, um, you may have been better off to just try and load it in full precision and have a big enough GPU to fit it in full precision. Let me just finish off this page here on server and API setup, and then we'll finally get to the full end-to-end -end example. Once you've got a GPU that will fit your model, the next things you want to do are pick the GPU, first of all, with decent upload and download speed. That means you can download your model to the GPU quickly. You don't want to be waiting forever before your um, model weights have been downloaded. And second of all, you want to look at flops. So flops is the computational power. We'll see this is specified in teraflops and you want this to be as high as possible, um, you know, subject to your price constraint so that you're able to process more tokens per second. All right, before I move to the end-to-end -end example, I just want to go back here and give you a look at the vast AI setup document. There is also one for RunPod as well, and you can find it in the server and API setup folder. So let's head into vast AI setup. So like with RunPod, you need to set up an account. There's an affiliate link if you'd like to support the Trellis channel, and I'll put that below in the description as well. Um, you'll need to add your credit card. You can add as little as $5 for Vast.ai. I think it's 10 for RunPod. Now you do need to set up an SSH key pair if you're going to use Vast.ai. Um, there are some instructions here on setting that up. And once it's set up, you'll be able to SSH in and connect to the instance. And after that point, you'll be able to send requests to um, an endpoint, which will be on your local host. Um, there's some tips here on GPU selection. But what I'm going to do is show you that in the live example end-to-end. -end. Okay, so for the end-to-end -end example, I'm going to show you how to serve uh, for as low as cost as possible um, a Mistral 7B Instruct model. It's going to be the V02, which just came out. And I'm going to show you how to serve it with VLLM and AWQ. So it's going to be quite a compact model, about 4 gigabytes in size. I'm also going to show you how to serve OpenChat 3.5, which is a very strong function calling model. In my experience, it's better than the Mistral models, including the V0.2. It's actually better than some of the larger models I've tested as well. So this model here will allow me to demonstrate uh, the software as well for calling the API with functions and handling the function responses as well for some specific requests around the weather. Okay, so let's get started here um, with Mistral 7B Instruct. And what I'm going to do is find, uh, assuming I've already set up my Vast AI account, which I have, I'm going to find a one-click template. I'll drop this in the description as well. What I'm going to do here is go to the Vast AI setup. Um, I assume I have my account set up. And I'm going to go all the way down to deploying an API with VLLM, which is what I said I'd focus on. And I'm gonna look for a one-click template. Scroll down here and open up this one-click template. We'll start with this one and we can come back. So here we are on the Vast AI console and we've got uh, the image. So we've got the VLL image. Let's just take a look at this here and I'll walk you through what's inside. Uh, so here, if we click edit, you can see it's using the VLLM, the latest Docker image. And here is the Docker options we have set up. Now the VLLM image, it runs the API on the 8000 port. Um, so we're going to map the 8000 port from the container, from the Docker container onto the 8000 port of the server. So there's Docker container, server, and then there's going to be our local host. Uh, I know that's a lot, but there's three things. Docker container, which is going to be 8000. Then we're going to map that to 8000 on 
the server. And then in a second, we're going to map 8,000 on the server to 8,000 on my local host on my computer. Okay, so we're going to run it with SSH. And here you can see um, the entry point. So this is the command that's going to, once the Docker container has installed everything like CUDA, it's then going to uh, allow us to run this command, which will start downloading the weights for this AWQ model. And we've set quantization to AWQ. <coughs> you need to set the D type to half. D type is the data type. A lot of models are trained with 32 bit precision, um, but often they're inferenced in 16. And AWQ actually uses 16 bit precision, but it then further packs it down to um, even lower number of bits. So you do need to specify D type as half. Half means half precision, which means 16 instead of 32. And I'm going to set the max model length of 2048 um, so that I can use a smaller uh, GPU in order to save money. Okay, so scrolling down to here, we have a little readme and it says when SSHing into this, um, so that's the SSH command, that's fine. Um, we're going to do that, so I'll show you live how that's going to work. So we click select and save. Uh, this is the recommended disk space. Actually, you could set that way down to like six or five because in quantized form, this model is quite a bit smaller. But anyway, space is not that expensive. It's the GPU that's expensive. The disk space is not. So here we're going to go to uh, price increasing. And let's see if I can increase my screen size. So You'll see here on the right hand side, the price per hour. Ooh, that's a cheap one there. Um, six cents per hour. It's even cheaper than uh, what I had said. So you'll see typically prices starting around um, 10 cents. And what I'm looking at now is I'm looking at the size of the VRAM, which is highlighted here. And I need to have at least probably, I don't know, probably around eight or something in terms of gigabytes. Um, but Really, if I can get a bit more, I like that. I like being a little bit over. And then I want to maximize the number of flops. Um, and also I'm looking here in small numbers, I'm looking at the upload and download speed. So I want this to be in a few hundred um, megabytes, uh, megabits per second. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see if there's, um, well, let's see if I can take this A2000. It's got 12 gigabytes. So that's plenty um, of VRAM given I'm quantized. It's not going to be that fast because I've got 11.2 flops. It could be better to go for something bigger, like um, maybe an A4000, like this here. There's 16 gigabytes and 20 flops. It's a little more expensive. So why don't we use the more expensive one to run the function calling? Not that it needs it. And I, for now, will just try to minimize cost. So I'm going to try run here. Um, can we actually run on this really cheap one? I don't see why not. Let's try it. Um, so I've clicked on rent. And if I go to the instances page, it's going to be creating. So we'll be able to follow up here on what's happening with that instance. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give that a few seconds just to start up. Let's take a look here at the logs for the AWQ instance. Uh, so it looks like the downloading has started and we have downloaded all of the files and you can see here there's a conversation template uh, for this chat and this all looks good. So you can see the UV corn has been set here. So we're now deployed on port 8000. So now we can head up and click on this little open SSH button. This will map port 8080 to localhost 8080, but actually we are running, uh, the VLL image is running on port 8000. So what we're gonna do is copy most of this and I'll take it to a terminal and I'll paste here. And instead of mapping to 8080, I'm gonna map to 8000. Now I, I could la map locally to 8080, it wouldn't make a difference, but um, I've set it to 8,000 and I'll say yes, I want to continue connecting. So now I'm connected via SSH and if I open up a new browser window here, I should be able to make a request 
um, make a quick request to test out that endpoint. So just to check how I can do that, let's go down here. Um, here's the instructions just reminding you to swap out the port mapping. And here are the instructions for doing a quick request to the API, which I'll do right here. And you can see it's working well. It's responding when I request. <coughs> it's responding when I request a list of models with the name of the model that I've loaded. So that is perfect. And I'm actually going to copy that model now because what we're going to do next is we're going to make some calls to that API. And the way we're going to do that is by going to the advanced inference repo. And I'm going to clone that all. I've cloned it all onto my local computer and we'll be using what's inside the API, API calls. We're going to be using some of the scripts for speed tests and later we'll be using some of the function API calls. So let's just move over to VS code. Um, I'm here in my .env. If you're doing this the first time, you're going to want to copy the sample.env and call it rename it.env. And what I've done is I have commented out the endpoint that would be used for run pod. And I've commented in this local host because I've mapped VLLM to um, 8000 on the local host. And here, I'm just going to paste in the model that we're using. So now what I can do is CD. So change directory into the API calls folder and then change directory um, into the speed test folder. So let's just uh, do LS. I think I'm already deep in the folders. So CD into API calls and speed tests. And we're going to start off <coughs> we're going to start off by doing a, via, a quick speed test. This is just going to send a prompt in to the API and ask it to write a long essay on the topic of spring. So I'll just do Python VLLM speed.py. And it's going to ask for a response that's going to be up to 500 tokens. So it'll take a few seconds to get back. And then it will tell us the time per token for making that simple request. And after that, we're going to test out uh, concurrent requests where we will ping it with many parallel requests just to see how it responds in that case. So let's see, first of all, okay. So we had uh, 19 prompt tokens. Uh, that was just me asking to talk about spring, 500 tokens generated and the tokens per second is about 40. So that's pretty good. It's well above uh, reading speed. If you're interested, um, we could just print out the conversation. Why don't I do that? I'll just run it once more just so you can see what text it's generating. And then we'll move to doing a concurrent re request where we send in a lot of requests at once. Okay, so you can see here, uh, write a long essay on topic of spring and here's title, spring, a season of renewal and rebirth, and then some paragraphs on spring. And you can see that it's truncated because I've put in a max of 500 tokens. So next up, we're going to move to concurrent tests. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to send requests every um, half a second, and we're going to send 20 requests. So 20 requests every half a second uh, and see what happens. So Python vllm.speed-concurrent-py. And you can see from this last request, takes about uh, 12 seconds to get the first request. And then after that, what we're going to see is multiple requests coming back here. Now, because we are hitting the API with multiple requests, it's going to be slower, but the bottleneck is typically reading the tokens, uh, reading the model weights deep into the CPU, into the GPU rather. Um, so actually you don't see too much uh, degradation. So you can see we're on request 17, request 20. So let's just look through that once more. You can see the first request is 20 tokens per second. So it's definitely slower um, by a factor of probably 1.7. And this is because we're starting to overload the GPU. And then as you move down towards the end of the requests, like, um, yeah, as we get to request 20, you can see total time is roughly around 22. So you're pretty well able to serve um, at least 
that many people if you've got about uh, 0.5 seconds you could probably increase that and go and look at serving either at a higher velocity now keep in mind that this uh, particular gpu has only got 10 teraflops so it's not the most powerful in terms of computation uh, it's an a2000 um, but it shows you you can run on a server that costs about 10 cents um, that costs about 10 cents per hour um, we'll push it a little more when we get to the function calling example just a brief recap from where we are. What I've done is I've shown you how to run on a very small GPU by using quantization, which reduces the model size and fixes it into a GPU that's lower in cost. The second thing that I'm doing is running a function calling model, and I'm going to run that in full precision, that 16-bit precision. I'm going to run it in 16 bits, and then I'll show you the function calling functionality. So let's get that function calling server set up again. I'm using the template here for vast AI and I'm going to edit that template or rather just check everything is in order so here's the template and it's going to be SSH connection we'll be calling the open chat v3 model and the max length is 2048 now there's one difference from what I showed earlier I've removed there was an extra uh, parameter here deep type of half so I'm just going to take that out uh, altogether it's only required if using the AWQ quantization. Okay, so that's all set up. And the last thing I need to do is append my hugging face token because this is a function calling model. So I've just added in here my hugging face hub token. Um, I've grabbed that from the token I created, a read token on hugging face. It's important this goes into the Docker options. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to reverse there. Let's go back in to edit that image. Yeah, it's important it goes into the Docker options here. So that all looks good. And next, we have uh, the entry point. So after the Docker container is loaded, this script is going to be run. And this is going to start up the VLLM server with these parameters. Notice that we have the max, max model length of 2048. I did have a parameter earlier I showed of dtype. That's a data type of half. That actually is only needed to be specified for the AWQ model. If you specify it here, it will give an inferior data type of uh, float 16 instead of B brain float 16, which is the default. That's a more um, efficient data type from a, an information theory perspective. So anyway, in short, don't put in the D type half parameter here if you're going to run it without using the AWQ quantization. Next, um, I do not need to put in this uh, hugging face hub token here with the on start script it should go as an environment variable so that's why I've got it up in the docker options and now we're ready to go so I'll select that and choose an instance for my next step so let's go across and sort these by price which looks like they are I'm going to want an instance that's 16 gigabytes um, because the model, when I load it, just the weights are going to be at least 14 gigabytes, and then I need room for the cache. So here, um, let's see, we have this instance here for 13 and a half cents, 20 teraflops. That's twice the computational power we had in the AWQ model, albeit at a cost of an extra three cents. So we're going to create the instance now. The Docker container will be the first thing to be installed, and then it'll run the VLLM server. Notice here that I'm specifying the model, but also the tokenizer. The reason that's important is we want to use the chat template, which is specific to function calling. You can see the tokenizer here. This is the uh, open chat 3.5 function calling repo, and you can see the chat template. It includes handling for the function metadata. It also includes handling for uh, function response and for the function call. So basically it's going to put in the function call when the machine returns it. It'll say function call and give the function call and it will also then when it gets response. Uh, the response being what our function gives back. It's going to paste that in and say here's the response to the function call. If helpful use it to respond to my question. Um, so we want VLLM to use this chat template and therefore we specify the tokenizer right here. All right, so the VLM server looks like um, it started. I can tell, um, I can tell from the disk usage that it's probably still downloading the weights. 
because we've only got uh, 0.2 out of 16 gigabytes that are used up so far. And I can also tell that the GPU is not currently uh, loaded with the weights because it's only got 0.3 out of 16 gigabytes being used. We can just check in on the logs. It should tell us about the status of downloading or if we've hit an error. And the good news is we haven't hit an error. You can see the weights are being downloaded. There are two files being downloaded, which correspond to the files here. Uh, we've got model one of two, which is about 10 gigabytes, and the second one is five gigabytes. And you can see those being downloaded. Uh, the first one, of course, well, the second file is smaller, so that'll be downloaded. It'll complete download first, and then it will download the first file. So we'll just take a quick break to allow the download. All right, so we have the instance up and running, and we're going to check the logs here. So this should show us that the weights have been downloaded. We just give it a second. All right. So the weights have been downloaded, and you can see that the default chat template, which is the one from the tokenizer, is being used. It's injecting the function metadata, and it's going to handle everything correctly. And we know that everything is running correctly because it says UV UVCorn is running on port 8000. Now, just um, one little tweak I did have to add. This is kind of tight, what we're doing, running in 16-bit precision with just 16 gigabytes of VRAM with the 7B model. It's kind of tight. Uh, so to make it fit, I had to increase the GPU memory utilization to 95%. The default, I think, is 90%. So you can kind of tweak out a bit more by uh, increasing that a little. And you can see here our GPU is using 14.8 out of 16 gigabytes. Um, so we're pretty close to the top. And in terms of disk space, we've got 14 gigabytes of weights downloaded onto a 16 gigabyte disk, which is fine. So let's uh, SSH. So I'm going to click here to get the SSH connection. And you remember that VLLM runs on port 8000, so I'm going to have to swap this here instead of port 8080. So let's head over to a terminal and let's paste that and make sure that we SSH into port 8000. So localhost 8000. Yes. And it looks like we're connected. So I can test out the connection by making a curl request to port 8000 and making this OpenAI open style request to ask for the models. And indeed, the model is OpenChat 3.5 function calling. So let's now head over to our scripts for calling the API. And just if you've git cloned this uh, repo here, we're going to go into API calls. And we're interested now in function API calls. So I'm going to CD into that folder function API calls. And we're going to run a VLLM function call.py. You'll notice that I've set up in the functions folder two different functions. One is to get the current weather. It just takes in a city and gives back the weather. And there's another one here that takes in the temperature and condition, and it gives out a response of what clothes you might wear given those conditions. So you can see I'll be able to make some change requests where uh, I ask for the weather, or I ask what clothes to wear in a city, and it'll have to make two function calls first to get the weather and then to get the clothes. I've also, uh, in OpenAI style, specified the tools. Here is the metadata for those two functions get weather and get clothes. We're ready now to run VLLM function call. Simply, it's going to take in a set of messages. We'll include the function metadata and then ask what the current weather is in London, just as a starting point. Now, I do need to specify here a few things. So first, I need to say what model we're using. I specified the model. And for FastAI, because we're running on port 8000 locally, that's what we're going to specify as the endpoint. All right. So we're ready now, and we can run Python, VLLM funk call.py. Let's see how it does handling that long. Yeah, great. So it's made a function call to get the weather. It's responded with the temperature, and it's told us the weather is cloudy or temperature 15. And we can try some uh, alternate requests, like what clothes should I wear? I'm in Dublin. So let's just save that. 
run it again and see if it gets the change response. So here what's happening is it first gets the weather in Dublin and it's 80 degrees party cloudy, sounds good for this time of year. And then it calls the get clothes function, which responds with what clothes to wear and then it summarizes. So yeah, open chat 3.5 is really, really good <laughs> for function calling. It's able to even do these chain function calls, which is pretty beautiful. All right, so that takes us through the function calling. While I have the model loaded though, let's also run some speed tests. So I'm gonna go into the speed uh, tests folder and let's just run uh, the basic speed test vllmspeed.py, which asks for a paragraph about spring. It'll generate about 500 tokens and measure the time for generating that. And you can kind of compare here. One, uh, one advantage is we've more computation power because we have 20 teraflops instead of 10. One disadvantage, though, is we are using full precision. So for doing a single API call, it's maybe a bit slower. Yeah, you can see here it's uh, about 25 tokens per second. And if you recall way earlier in the video, let's see what kind of speed we were getting. Uh, we were getting about 40 tokens per second. So if you make a single request, you're going to get better performance um, by being in quantized form, even in this case, if you had less computational power. So let's just do a quick concurrent test. Remember in the concurrent test, we're pinging every 0.5 seconds and we're doing 20 requests in a row. So we're trying to put the server under pressure to be able to deliver a lot of responses or handle a lot of requests rather. So we'll see now how low the speed drops down below the baseline of 25 tokens per second. And actually you can see that the performance is not dropping down a lot. And this is because we have more computational power and also we don't have to do any dequantization. We're just directly doing BF16, directly doing 16-bit uh, computation. GPUs are designed generally for 32 or 16-bit uh, multiplications. So if you quantize, you have to kind of dequantize, which costs you extra computational power. And that's not a problem if you're sending one request because you have tons of computation. Um, you end up being memory, memory bottlenecked. But... Uh, if you're trying to send lots of requests, you don't want to be dequantizing all of those. So actually sending lots of requests, you can be better off running in uh, the full 16-bit precision rather than running quantized. Whereas if you're just running one request, you're probably better off running uh, running not quantized. Okay, so um, or rather you're, with one request, you're often better off running quantized. So here you can see we're getting uh, about 20 down to uh, you know 14 tokens per second. And... Let's see if we can get that uh, to 100. I'm going to really put a lot of pressure on here. I'm going to make requests every eighth of a second, and I'm going to send in 100 requests. So this is a fairly intensive use case, but let's see what happens. Now, each request is taking about at least, it's going to take at least 25 to 30 seconds to complete. So we're going to have overlapping of the requests because uh, there's eight requests every second. So 100 requests, it's going to take roughly 12 seconds. So basically, I'm completely overlapping all of these requests, which is what I want to put pressure on the server. Okay, so I've let that run out now. And you can see when I put in 100 requests at the same time, the first uh, request takes me 26 seconds to come back, an average of 18 tokens, 19 tokens per second. And if I scroll all the way down, you can see the last request really is quite delayed. Uh, it takes... This is not the time, well, this is the time from which I made the first request until the last request was completed. And it's about uh, three minutes with an average of about uh, three tokens per second. So you can see that certainly for this size of GPU with 20 teraflops, you're probably not in a good place if you want to serve uh, 100 customers. I think though, if you want to serve um, maybe 10 customers in concurrent requests, then let's just run that quickly. I think you're going to be in good shape and have pretty good tokens per second. Yes, indeed. So no problem with 10 tokens or 10 concurrent requests. You've got 22 tokens per second. And even all the way down as far as your 10th request, you're still getting about 18 tokens per second. So 
keeping pretty much ahead of uh, reading speed. And that's it, folks, for this video on inference. A few tips, though, before I go. I've shown you particularly small servers that minimize the cost. And I think this is good if you start off with a relatively smaller number of customers and you don't have too many concurrent requests. I've shown you a case where I've gone up as far as 100 concurrent requests. And if you feel the tokens per second is too low, then you can simply move to a larger GPU. One idea is you can sort the GPUs on vast.ai according to the cost per hour per teraflop. And you can see which units are going to give you the cheapest cost per unit of compute. Now, just to summarize the overall video, if you're going to serve a model, the cheapest way is probably to use some service like OpenAI or maybe Google's Gemini. But if you need privacy or to serve a custom model, then that's why I made this video. First off, you need to choose where you're going to rent your GPU. If you're going to serve a larger model, then probably you might want to use an A100 or an A6000. And they're similarly priced from RunPod or from VastAI. If you're going to serve a smaller model, then you can use a cheaper GPU, perhaps down as cheap as 10 cents per hour. And if you want to fit inside one of those GPUs, quantization can be helpful. That might mean using AWQ if you're using VLLM to set up your API, or it might mean using the EETQ or the BNB or the Bits and Bytes NF4 option uh, with TGI. Now, once you have those set up, you can inference using functions or without functions by using some custom code, such as is provided in the advanced inference repo. All right, folks, next up, I'll be planning a video on inferencing larger models, including mixture of experts. So keep an eye out for that one. But in the meantime, let me know any questions on this one down in the comments. Cheers.